Okay, well, good morning, and uh, uh, thank you. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Kazemi, it's nice to see you. Happy holidays to everybody. Um, I see Dr. Blumenthal here also, our co-chair, and we're very excited about today's topic. Good morning, Scott. How are good you? Good morning, guys and girls. Hope everybody's uh, happy and healthy. Yes. And Dr. Thank Geyer's you. here. Our friends from Plano are going to carefully watch what our colleagues in Little Rock, Arkansas, Stones Throw Over have to say. Today's topic I am particularly excited about because as um, news knows, I love the craniocervical junction and there are a lot of actually unanswered questions. So I'm particularly curious uh, about today's uh, articles and what you say. Rick, how are you? No artificial discs yet for the craniocervical junction, right, Rick? <laughs> No, no, not yet. We're, we're working on it. I'm sure you do. Exactly. To your uh, speakers and topic. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chapman. Uh, we, we're honored to join you um, uh, on behalf of the University of Arkansas I, I'm, and my residents. I'm honored to have been uh, given the opportunity to present at the Journal Club this, this morning. Like you said, this topic is a uh, very interesting topic for the spine surgeon. Uh, typically, it, it lands somewhere between the domain of the skull base surgeon, uh, the, the otolaryngologist and, and spine surgeons as to what to do. And it is not an infrequent problem that presents itself uh, from time to time. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the puzzle has not been completely solved yet. And there are multiple uh, different pathways to, to thinking about uh, what this uh, entity is and how to solve it. So uh, in today's journal club, we just plan to uh, present, uh, focus on the surgical management, uh, which is what I think uh, spine surgeons would like to know and, uh, and recruit other surgeons as available to help them in, in solving what is potentially a difficult uh, entity to solve. Uh, so we're, uh, I, I'll be joined in moderation uh, by Dr. Deb Bomick uh, from uh, Duke uh, School of Medicine, uh, who is a colleague and uh, uh, a, uh, an expert in the craniocervical junction, and hopefully Dr. Uh, J.D. Day uh, from our Department of Neurosurgery as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we will commence uh, with a progression of surgical treatments um, designed uh, to treat this from uh, the past to, mo to most modern. And the first uh, paper is actually a paper that we wrote at our institution uh, about uh, a direct uh, far lateral approach to the craniocervical junction. So uh, Dr. William Coggins, uh, PGY3, uh, take it away, Will. All righty, thank you, Dr. Kazemi. Let me get my screen, uh, screen shared. Uh, so thanks everyone uh, for inviting us to host another uh, one of these CL Science Foundation get-togethers. It's great to have you here. Uh, my name is Will Coggins. I'm a PGY3 at UAMS, um, and I'll be kicking off our talk, uh, which is entitled Surgical Management of Basilar Invagination at the Craniocervical Junction. What should a spine surgeon know and do? So my paper was published by our institution a few years ago as a, a case series. And it really details the way of our, our faculty have approached this pathology. Uh, symptomatic basilar invagination uh, is a neurosurgical pathology of the cranial cervical junction that can result in a wide variety of symptoms, ranging from headache, neck pain, myelopathy, uh, to lower cranial nerve um, dysfunction, uh, just to name a few. Unfortunately, treatment of this pathology is, is not straightforward to address namely due to its relatively central location within the skull base and the uh, complicated vascular anatomy surrounding it. Um, as such, there have been numerous different approaches to uh, lessen morbidity and still provide adequate decompression of the brainstem. Some of these approaches my colleagues are gonna address in future papers. For my part, uh, I will be discussing the far lateral transcondylar approach uh, for an odontoidectomy, uh, plus or minus a clival resection um, as indicated. Uh, in this, our, for our part, we follow this up with a second stage occipital cervical fusion um, due to the instability created. Uh, 
the approach is fairly complicated. And since I only have a few minutes, I've really broken it down to three major parts, the opening, uh, addressing the vertebral artery, and then uh, followed by the bony work. So just a quick slide on the basics of basilar invagination. Um, it's typically congenital or de uh, degenerative rheumatoid arthritis with a, a panis around the dens being the most common, uh, some of the more common causes. The pathophysiology is thought to be as a result from recurrent microfractures uh, from repetitive axial loading. Uh, it's often associated with disorders such as syringomyelia, curie malformation, um, osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, and clipophile syndrome, to name a few. Uh, the radiographic diagnosis is typically based on these lines over here. Um, these are the mid-sagittal cranial vertebral parameters. Um, and you have the Chamberlain line, uh, which is from the hard palate to the epistheon, uh, very similar to McGregor's line, which is from the posterior edge of the hard palate to the most uh, posterior uh, portion of the occipital curve. Uh, and then McRae's line, which is a line from the uh, base of the clivus to the epistheon. And uh, generally speaking, if the DENS is uh, extending uh, superiorly five to seven millimeters above these lines, then you have a diagnosis of bas basilar invagination. And as you can see from the pictures below, this can be a, a fairly impressive pathology and something that uh, may be certainly referred to as spine surgeon um, from uh, primary care folks. Um, for our opening, uh, patients are initially positioned in the lateral decubitus position or the park bench position. Um, the side of the approach is typically dictated by the non-dominant vertebral artery. Uh, the head is flexed and tilted slightly towards the vertex with the face horizontal. Cranial pins are placed to the mastoid and the inion on the contralateral side and then the ipsilateral forehead. Um, in B, you can see our surface landmarks, uh, which are the mastoid tip and then the transverse processes of C1 and C2. And then we plan a, a lazy S uh, posterior auricular incision um, as well. Um, from there, once you've gone through the skin, you have your superior posterior lateral musculature. Uh, so first you'll encounter the SCM. Um, below that, once you've elevated it, uh, you'll have the splenius capitis, the longissimus capitis, and the levator scapulae. Um, once these muscles have been appropriately divided and elevated, uh, you should be able to palpate down, find the um, transverse process of C1. Uh, and there you can see your um, obliquus capitis superior and obliquus capitis inferior. Uh, medially, you will have your rectus capitis posterior major, and these three muscles make up your suboccipital triangle. Uh, deep to the triangle, importantly, is the vertebral artery, which is going to guide the remainder of the dissection. Uh, from there, you'll detach these deep cervical muscles from the C2 transverse process uh, and expose your uh, ganglion of C2 and your dorsal and ventral rami. Um, the nerve root is going to course over the portion of the vertebral artery that's traversing between the atlas and the axis. And so that also helps you identify uh, your vert. At this point, the venous plexus surrounding the vertebral artery is sharply dissected and you're going to achieve hemostasis from it. Um, further exposure is going to uh, yield your cervical dura. Um, and then uh, this is a cadaveric dissection on these pictures on the right and, and pointing out some of the pitfalls of this procedure. Farther lateral and anterior to your transverse processes are going to be major vascular structures, namely your IJ, your carotid that isn't seen, but also lower cranial nerves such as 11 and 12. Next, we'll address the vertebral artery uh, and really to get adequate bony exposure to do the, the major portion of this procedure, the vertebral artery has to be transposed. Um, this is first done by removing your posterior arch and your C1 uh, transverse process, uh, followed by the epidural or atlanto-occipital band. Uh, from there, you can gently mobilize the vert uh, posterior and inferior uh, to get it out of the way with vessel loops. If necessary, and you can see this in C, you can sacrifice the C1 ramus to enhance your exposure. And then you've exposed your occipital condyle very nicely and also your C1 lateral mass. Moving on to the main portion of the procedure, the bony work. Um, and D, you see the vertebral artery has been transposed uh, in E and F. Uh, you start by removing the posterior medial portion of the occipital condyle. The boundaries that we use are the hypoglossal canal laterally and then the frame and magnum medially. Uh, after 
the, this removal, you're going to remove your C1 lateral mass, uh, and this will expose the dens. So once you've exposed your uh, dens um, in uh, G and H, we see that uh, you can drill it out in the eggshell, the cortical bone, and then gently remove that with a, a sharp dissection from your dural and ligaments. Uh, the transverse ligament has to be uh, sharply divided and resected uh, to remove basically most of the adoptoid. Uh, and so then um, at this point in J or K, depending on your preoperative imaging and the degree of brainstem compression, uh, an inferior clival resection may be needed. And in this case, it was, it was utilized. Uh, once, once you're done with that and achieving adequate hemostasis, uh, you can replace the vertebral artery, uh, and we perform a meticulous closure of the uh, musculature, reapproximating it into the appropriate planes to augment healing and ensure there are no complications postoperatively. Uh, the patient has to be in a hard cervical orthosis after this, as it's inherently destabilizing, uh, and we typically wait one to two days and follow this up with a occipital cervical fusion. Um, if posterior decompression is needed, that would typically be done um, during the second stage. So as far as our outcomes, uh, over the course of several years, uh, we treated nine patients with basilar invagination with this method. The majority of our patients were young and middle-aged. Um, the most common symptoms were pain, whether it was headache or neck pain, followed by a neurologic deficit, namely numbness, weakness, and oftentimes myelopathy. Um, we performed an odontidectomy in all of these procedures. Uh, and then inferior, a resection of the inferior clivus was really only needed for two of these patients. Um, as far as complications go, there were two vertebral artery injuries. Um, both of these were repaired primarily intraop, and unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, those patients did not suffer any post op sequelae. Um, importantly, all of our patients reported symptom improvement. Um, and then above, you can see, uh, this is just a CT demonstrating the occipital cervical fusion that's typically done um, with an occipital plate C2 parse screws. And sometimes, uh, depending on the extent of um, uh, surgeon judgment, needing to go down to C3 and 4 for fusion. And then you can see D, a, a preoperative MRI and E postoperative. So you really can achieve very nice decompression with this approach. Uh, just to briefly talk about risk benefits. Risk of this procedure, obviously, vertebral artery injury. Um, it's a major point of the opening and exposure, uh, and it is put at high risk. Um, this trajectory uh, is typically unfamiliar for most neurosurgeons and spine surgeons, and anatomy is quite complicated. Um, another risk would be it necessitates a secondary fusion surgery since uh, with our removal of the C1 lateral mass, we're causing instability. Um, benefits of the procedure it decreases risk of infection from oral or nasoflora uh, that have been associated risk with transoral or transnasal approaches. Uh, it, it decreases morbidity associated with addressing this pathology because you're, you don't see the same degree of oral pharyngeal dysfunction that the transoral specifically approach um, causes oftentimes. And then it really provides a nice wide operative corridor uh, and allows us to circumferentially approach the odontoid. Um, and oftentimes, finally, it's very amenable to approaching the retroflex dens that can also be difficult um, to address when you are approaching the craniocervical junction through an anterior means. Uh, and with that, that's all I have. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Will. Um, very interesting uh, a paper uh, of, of our series. Uh, or so, so we we think uh, this has been the approach to basilar invagination and uh, pathology at this craniocervical uh, junction for us, and it's it's proven uh, useful for, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, that uh, we're able to avoid all of the sequelae of the nasal flora, uh, risk of infection. Uh, from either an, or the oral floor or nasal floor that you'd approach, that you'd have from a more anterior approach. Um, and the second is that uh, we do have um, the expert help of a skull-based surgeon uh, who, who obviously is very comfortable with this approach. To most spine surgeons, this is a rather treacherous uh, surgical corridor. Um, you, you definitely 
need to be experienced with respect to performing it. Um, but we found that, that as the learning curve, as you rise on the learning curve, uh, the approach becomes uh, much more uh, accessible and much more uh, useful for us. Um, great question asked uh, uh, by one of our panelists was, why, why decompress uh, this way first and not reduce um, and fuse from the posterior? Um, we think that we can get to the clivus as needed and get a better decompression this way. And so uh, as the spine surgeon who, who's performed the second stage of the OC fusion, uh, I've rarely then had to perform either a foramen magnum decompression or a C1 uh, uh, decompression, C1 laminectomy and, uh, and, and de decompression. Uh, but it's, a, it's also a good point about um, uh, vertical uh, disimpaction and atlantaaxial distraction uh, to achieve ligament ataxis. And we'll address that in a subsequent uh, paper. Um, as, as for staging or not, in our practice, in our hands, we found that staging is effective. Uh, the patient is effectively treated the second stage the very next day. Uh, we haven't had any issues in between, uh, but uh, single stage of doing this all at once could certainly happen. Um, in our hands, we found it more efficient to, to break it up in two stages. All right. Uh, any comments from uh, our panelists? I had one small one. This is Jens. So thank you. I mean, this is amazing surgical skill. And um, I had one small little editorial comment. So I would suggest that um, these basivertebral invaginations from RA are not a degenerative process. This is histologically completely different from what this actually is. It's an inflammatory disease process. And the histochemical changes are profoundly different, and so are the biomechanics. So I, I just warn against uh, subsummating inflammatory diseases into a degenerative disease pool, uh, which I think it objectively is not. So just a small little point of uh, my personal clarification request. Um, I, I will withhold my comment on um, whether we really need to go um, anteriorly or anterolaterally or laterally for these diseases because again for me one of my most amazing procedures as a young surgeon was to clean up the odontoid anteriorly and it literally has stopped being a uh, factor with vertical disimpaction and a stable fixation and uh, then a secondary anterior decompression while frequently threatened to the patient almost becomes a non-factor so i'm just gonna withhold mm -hmm. that dr amin salek uh, good morning or good evening wherever you are um, uh, says uh, also, this is almost gone as we're doing a better job with C1, C2 fixation earlier. And this is again an end stage product of C1, C2 instability, where basically this vertical migration happens to a destruction of the atlantoaxial joint. It's not so much the uh, occipital cervical joint, it's the uh, atlantoaxial joint destruction that leads to this. So, doc uh, Dr. Amin Salek, thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chapman. Very good points made, especially about the distinction between degenerative and inflammatory, and I totally agree. Um, Will, could you stop sharing your slides? Um, great. And um, yeah, I, I think, as you said, you do need a, 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 a significant, uh, you need to be up the learning curve with respect to the surgical technique. Um, it definitely is uh, a skill that needs to be acquired. Um, we have a video, uh, the, the publication itself comes with a video as a link. So if you, if you would like, uh, if, you, if you Google uh, or PubMed the, the publication, you'll find the link to the video and hopefully that'll be instructive as well. All right, well, uh, we'll move on in the progression of the surgical techniques from this posterior lateral or far lateral technique uh, to that of the anterior approaches. And then uh, Natalie Gooley, our PGY5, uh, will uh, go ahead and uh, present on the uh, endonasal endoscopic technique. Thank you, Natalie. All right, thank you guys so much for having us back. Um, I'm Natalie Gooley, I'm the fifth year, as Dr. Kazimi said, I'm gonna be talking about a single center's experience with endoscopic endonasal odontoidectomy. This is by a group out of um, out of Ottawa. 
So before we touched on this, because we're not going to fully discuss the trans oral approach, but predominantly endoscopic and nasal was created as a response to some of the, the downfalls of the trans oral approach, I thought it was worth touching on. So this approach allows direct visualization of C1 and 2 through the posterior oropharynx. So as you can see in this picture, you place retractors into the mouth and the surgeon uses a scope uh, to allow visualization of that area. So this has significant drawbacks as we've kind of already mentioned, pri primarily infection and post-operative velopharyngeal insufficiency, which can result in, as, as a result of having to, to um, uh, section the soft palate. And this can result in difficulties with swallowing and breathing that can last for some time after surgery. So access to the odontide process via an entirely endonasal approach was, was kind of designed to respond to some of the downfalls of the oral approach. And it was first described in a cadaveric study by, by Alfieri in 2002, and then clinically reported by Kassam and company in 2005. So briefly go over some of the anatomy of the endonasal approach. An endoscope is placed into the nose and that is uh, taken along this hard and soft palate down back to the back of the nasopharynx where the mucosa is then, is then opened. Important surgical landmarks when opening the mucosa are the eustachian tubes laterally, and it allows direct visualization of the clivus and the anterior arch of C1. So most of these pictures are taken from the paper directly, except for this one. I, I grabbed a cadaveric picture to show the actual incision in the mucosa and the eustachian tubes, which can be seen here laterally. So the steps of the surgical technique are first the incision and then the section out uh, laterally. And this allows visualization of the caudal third of the clivus and the anterior arch of C1, which is then taken out to reveal the lateral masses. The drilling uh, begins at the caudal portion of the claw, uh, sorry, the clivus and the anterior arch of C1. This is carried laterally until the lateral masses are encountered. The anterior arch of C1 is removed, and this allows identification of the odontoid process and the alar ligaments, which are then split. The odontoid is hollowed out, and the odontoidectomy is performed in a piecemeal fashion. These are some additional diagrams that I thought felt helped clarify some of the surgical steps. So this diagram shows the drilling of C1 anterior arch hollowing out of the odontoid. And then this diagram again shows the same stepwise progression, taking off the anterior arch of C1, hollowing out the odontoid, removal of the odontoid in a piecemeal fashion. And importantly, the transverse ligament is then in place um, posteriorly. This is another endoscopic view that I thought really demonstrated well the eustachian tubes laterally, the anterior arch of C1 has been removed and then the odontoid process is here. So the advantages of an endoscopic endonasal approach are primarily when compared with the transoral approach. And they do give a little bit of an enhanced exposure and visualization for primarily of the caudal portion of the clivus if that type of decompression is necessary. There's a theoretical decreased risk of infection by oral flora since it theoretically takes place in the nasopharynx, not the oropharynx, although this is kind of a subtle difference. There's, the literature has shown there's a reduced hospital length of stay, ventilation time, and rate of post-operative tracheostomy. And also there, it's possible to have an earlier extubation and earlier post-operative feeding with this type of approach. The methods for this paper, it was primarily a retrospective not primarily, it was entirely a retrospective chart review at a single institution performed from January 2011 to May 20, uh, 2019. They looked at intra and post-operative complications. They included patients that were greater than 18 years of age who underwent the endoscopic approach either with or without posterior OC fusion. This was performed at the Ottawa Hospital in Ontario. Importantly, they did exclude tumors that had secondary odontoid involvement. The treatment algorithm described by this group is that they first uh, radiologically demonstrated compression of the cervicomedullary junction or basilar invagination with symptoms. Preoperative CT and MRI was obtained of the brain and spine. And then a referral to an endoscopic skull-based otolaryngologist for, was performed in this particular study, although it's important to note that other people um, or skull-based neurosurgeons can perform this approach themselves. 
A surgical plan is then made and the surgery is performed, most of them in a staged fashion, but some, you know, with an OC fusion on the same day or sometimes prior to or after the odontoidectomy. Postoperatively, CT scan and spine radiographs are obtained, were obtained prior to discharge. And then at one month follow-up with neurosurgery, a CT or an MRI was, was performed and spine radiographs. Finally, in this particular study, six-month follow-up was done with otolaryngology. These are some uh, pictures that demonstrate the pathology in their series. And you can see in this first picture, this patient has a congenital fusion of the occiput to C1, causing basilar invagination at this level. And then these two slides demonstrate significant arthritic panis formation with subsequent compression of this craniocervical junction. These are their post-operative images that they included in their paper, which show, um, as we talked about, you can address the pathology by drilling off the caudal portion of the clivus, and the entire odontoid is then removed, allowing good decompression. Their series ended up uh, having 17 patients in it with a median age of 67, predominantly female. The most common presenting symptom in their patients in 13 of 17 was myelopathy. About half, nine with severe compression of the cervical medullary junction, and then eight of them with severe symptomatic basilar invagination. Eight of these were performed as staged operations with the um, two of the eight having the OC fusion first and the remainder had the OC fusion subsequently. In non-stage surgeries, the median surgery time was 570 minutes. One person in their series did not undergo an OC fusion, and they described that this is um, due to the patient no longer being safe for surgery after their initial surgery. The primary outcomes in their, in their series were that seven of their 17 patients were able to be immediately extubated. Ten of them did require prolonged intubation, but of those ten, seven of them were actually extubated on postoperative day one, two of those on postoperative day two, and then one of them required um, extubation on postoperative day eight. The hospital length of stay was 13 days. Clinical improvement was very good in their, in their series with 14 of 17 patients, or 82%, with complete resolution of their myelopathy symptoms. And then as we described, their radiographic improvement showed adequate decompression on all of their postoperative imaging. 29% of their series experienced intraoperative complications. The most common was CFF leak with four patients. This was rep repaired with a synthetic duroplasty and a nasoceptal flap with fibrin glue. Thankfully, none of these postoperative, um, none of these patients had postoperative CFF, CSF leak issues. One patient did have a significant vertebral artery injury, which occurred during removal of the base of the odontoid. This was subsequently um, required coil embolization, but thankfully the patient did not have any residual deficits. Postoperative complications were um, experienced by 11 of their 17 patients, and the primarily or the most common complication was dysphagia with eight of their 17 patients. Four of these had already had preoperative dysphagia problems, and six of the eight resolved prior to discharge from the hospital. One did take six months to resolve, and one required placement of a G-tube. They did note on this last patient that required G-tube placement, the patient had had significant cranial neuropathy dysphagia prior to surgery. Uh, epistaxis in one patient, which was mild and resolved with packing, sinus infection in three patients that resolved with antibiotics, and early hardware failure that required, required reoperation in one patient. And then finally, two patients had urinary tract infections, which were resolved with antibiotics. This is a diagram from their paper that kind of shows all of the complications from their series, just to demonstrate that the most uh, common complication was transient postoperative dysphagia, which was followed by intraoperative CSF leak. So overall in their series, they felt that this approach was well tolerated and predominantly only had transient complications. It did demonstrate a lower morbidity and mortality than the literature reports for the transoral procedures. And as has been demonstrated in other studies, such as the Goldschlager et al. study, 
the time to extubation was quicker than compared with transoral, one versus three and a half days. And this was confirmed in their series as well. They felt that this phase was not only likely was not only linked to the oropharyngeal swelling from the actual approach and the surgery itself, but probably changes in the oropharyngeal dynamics due to the OC fusion, which is of course going to be a problem with anybody that undergoes OC fusion. And the limitations of the study are kind of obvious. It is a single center retrospective in nature. They did not perform comparative statistics, but I think overall this paper adds to the body of literature on um, on this type of approach. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Gooley. Um, definitely an interesting paper. And again, one that advocated for a quote unquote decompression versus uh, treatment of this vertical axis instability that, that we'll learn a little bit more about. Um, I want to ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Bomick, uh, as to his thoughts of this approach and specifically um, the, the concept of fuse, uh, of fixing uh, the OC um, segments first prior to this decompression versus the other way around. Do you think that there will be some limitation with respect to the decompression if fixation is achieved first? It's interesting. They only had two out of their series that, that had the fixation first. So I wonder if that was earlier on in their learning curve of this technique. Um, I, I... I'm fairly opinionated on this subject, and I, I completely agree with Jens on his his feeling on on uh, treating this uh, entity. I feel now that we have sort of the indirect decompression approach, the you know vertical disc impaction type of approach to these uh, um, uh, basilar invagination patients, and and the the large majority of these patients having uh, Inflammatory disease that can be, you know, very easily treated uh, with with uh, fusion surgery. It's it's almost unnecessary to do these types of uh, uh, anterior decompressions. That being said, I've done any number of these anterior decompressions on patients with severe basilar invagination or uh, or congenital uh, malformations that cause uh, basilar invagination. And the, the one utility that I find is that uh, is I feel very strongly that you do the posterior part first uh, at, with fixation, whether it be a C12 fusion or an OC fusion. That way you don't incur the risk of instability or, you know, I, I don't trust the halos and whatnot uh, with, you know, the patients moving around, especially with the larger size patients. And then uh, with the with the vertical disimpaction, you you do what you can from the back. And if you have a residual uh, anterior compression, then you can uh, go at it from from uh, endoscopic approach. I do have to say that you know we have some papers published on this subject matter. It, you know it completely depends on your partners. Uh, you know I certainly am not. Uh, I, I would. I, I guess over the years, I've become better at endoscopic uh, spine surgery, but I certainly am not really good at getting through the sinuses and whatnot. So I have, you know, some of the best ENT surgeons in the country that that can get me back there. And what we've found is with the use of angled endoscopes, with the use of, um, you know, uh, drilling of the hard palate, it is very unlikely that you have to do uh, a huge exposure from the front. You can you can pretty much you could you can almost do a full C two corpectomy endoscopically if you need to, and the patients really do have a significant improvement o over the the traditional oral transoral approach with uh, mm -hmm. with swallowing. Yeah. You know, it, this used to be an operation uh, when I got out of fellowship that, you know, oftentimes would necessitate a feeding tube, potentially, you know, uh, uh, a period of intubation. And now with the endoscopic, you know, transnasal approach, it's, it's essentially, you know, patients going to the floor as long as you don't have a, uh, a complication. So it's, and these patients go home pretty quickly. Now, as far as OC fusion versus C12 fusion depends on the pathology. If it, 
you know, if it's rheumatoid arthritis, then, you know, I don't, uh, I, I just, I have gone to just doing C12 fusions. Um, if it's a, if it's a congenital pathology, I, I, uh, I, I assess what the actual malformation is and oftentimes they will get an OC fusion. Yeah, thank you. Great point. I, I mean, I think that in, in a significant proportion of these patients, there is a congenital anomaly, either uh, cranialization of C1 or clipophile or uh, some kind of uh, congenital variant, basically, that, that dictates that the occiput would be included anyway. It seems to me that there's two camps and, 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 the, and, and the, the camps are split basically in the definition of what is severe. You know, if, if we consider severe basal invagination where there's retroversion of the odontoid and very severe um, impaction of the brainstem, then can, that, can we really rely on indirect decompression um, uh, as correction of the, you know, this vertical axis instability to achieve the decompression? Uh, versus a direct decompression. To me, that appears to be, you know, the main question uh, of the dividing line between these two. Anyway, that segues brilliantly into the next article uh, by Dr. Helton, our uh, PGY6 resident here, who will uh, discuss the, uh, uh, the, the distraction technique. Thank you, Matthew. Here we go. Matthew, okay. I'm a, I, yeah, I know I was muted. Um, I'm a, all right. So hello, friends. I'm Matthew Helton. I'm a PGY6 neurosurgery resident here at UAMS. Today, I'm going to be presenting a recent paper um, called titled A Safe and Effective Posterior Intraarticular Distraction Technique to Treat Congenital Atlantoaxial Dislocation Associated with basal invag Invagination. I have no disclosures. This paper was published in Operative Neurosurgery in 2021. It's a paper out of a, a Chinese neurosurgery department. However, it does involve some um, American colleagues, such as Dean Chow. Um, the background behind this is congenital atlantoaxial dislocation, along with basilar invagination, leads to ventral compression of the brainstem by the displaced odontoid, as some of my co-residents have mentioned previously. Two measurements I want to point out at the beginning of this paper are the atlantodental interval, which is the distance between the dens and the anterior arch of C1, along with Chamberlain's line, which is the, the line between the hard palate and the pistion. This is important in the methods of the paper. So this is a retrospective case series of a single surgeon from March 2017 to August 2018. Inclusion criteria um, included, so they defined atlantoaxial dislocation as an ADI of greater than three millimeters and basilar invagination of the odontoid uh, is what's greater than five millimeters above Chamberlain's line. Um, they also only included patients that had partial or complete fusion of the uh, occiput to C1. They excluded uh, more common pathologies such as rheumatoid arthritis, osteodontoidium, any patients with a history of trauma, history of occipital cervical surgery, um, patients with osteoporosis infection or metastatic disease. So they for their outcomes, they measured two types of outcomes, functional and radiographic. The functional outcome, they used the modified Japanese Orthopedic Association myelopathy scores. If you remember correctly, the, um, it's a score from 0 to 18, 18 being normal. It's a patient-filled-out survey. Um, it gave gives different weight to different systems. Um, upper extremity motor had has a 0 to 5 range. Lower extremity motor, 0 to 7 upper extremity sensory 0 to 3 and urinary 0 to 3 to give a total of 18 possible points for normal individuals. Uh, radiographic parameters were measured, um, and I'll get into that later in the results section. Preoperatively, all patients had a CT, CTA, and MRI performed. They also had CT, CT, and MRI, along with an x-ray performed at one week post-op, six and 12 months post-op as well. At six and 12 months, if the CT scan did not demonstrate um, See atlantoaxial bony osseous bone bridge or osseous formation, then they would perform dynamic imaging to ensure that there was indeed fusion. So the surgical technique begins with a patient being positioned in a prone position and traction was applied using Gardner Wells tongs. The traction um, that they uh, applied was up to one eighth of the, the patient's body weight. 
it's a typical dissection posteriorly uh, subperiosteal dissection to expose the um, subocciput and the C2 uh, vertebra. Now remember that most of these patients had uh, cranialized uh, C1 or um, cranialized atlases, so you don't see the, the posterior arch very well depicted in this image. Uh, you can appreciate the C2 nerve roots laterally. Um, so in the picture on the right, the patient, the uh, surgeon is actually using dissectors to enter into the atlantoaxial joint that's discovered here and on the left side here. And these stills are taken from an operative video that the, that the senior author published in um, Neurosurgery Focus in 2020 as well. So I just want to make that disclaimer. Um, so the next step after identifying the atlantoaxial joint is they uh, place these dilators in on the left and right side, and, and it was sequentially dilated, left, right, left, right, increasing size. And the question is, when do you stop? Well, they, they determined how much dilation they wanted to achieve based on the, the distance the odontoid was above Chamberlain's line. So in, I think this example, the patient had an uh, eight millimeters of odontoid above Chamberlain's line. So they wanted to dilate the atlantal axial joint up to eight millimeters to achieve that indirect decompression we've been speaking of. Now, remember that a lot of these patients, because of the cranialized C1, um, you're going to see an anomalous course of the vertebral artery. So in a lot of cases, the vertebral artery is much closer to the C2 nerve root than we're used to in standard patients. And so you have to be mindful of that when retracting. Uh, so here they have an example of retracting the C2 nerve root along with the vertebral artery, and then the dilation is performed. Um, you can notice that the way the dilators are designed, they have these smooth, rounded um, uh, edges. And, and the reason for this is so that they avoid a damage to the cortical surface. You want to strip away the um, cartilaginous, the cartilaginous uh, portion of the joint, but you want to maintain that cortical surface so there's no settling of the permanent graft when you place it um, and no subsidence to maintain the indirect decompression you've achieved. So once they dilate it up to the uh, distance, they they deem preoperatively. The next step is they bring in actually an intraoperative CT or an O-arm scan and scan the patient and they can actually uh, appreciate how much reduction they've achieved um, of, the, of the odontoid out of the uh, frame and magnum, which I think that they've had a good result here. Um, finally, once they're uh, pleased with their results on the O-arm spin, then they place the permanent grafts, which were custom made for these cases, um, and, and they used iliac um, bone graft harvest, harvested from the patient for the fusion. Next step, they put in C2 or, um, PAR screws. If the PARs could not accommodate a screw, they would use a um, they would use translaminar screws for C2. And then they also placed the occipital plate. And this is a key maneuver, I think, in this procedure is that they pre-bent the rods and then they used a cantilever mechanism to and reduced the rods onto the occipital plate in order to tilt that odontoid further anterior and out of the spinal canal to, to provide even more indirect decompression. So we can see the preoperative and postoperative uh, studies. Uh, preoperatively, the patient, you could really appreciate that um, stenosis at the frame and magnum, along with a small syrinx associated with it. And postoperatively, they were able to achieve very nice uh, reduction of the atlantodental interval and get the, the odontoid out of the uh, frame and magnum, uh, allowing for that indirect decompression. So I think it's a very nice result. So the surgeon was operated on 65 patients in that short span of time. 32 patients had two years of follow-up, uh, 22 males, 43 females. 50 of the 65 patients had vertebral artery anomalies. Um, so a high percentage of these patients with occipital cervical deformities or congenital deformities will have vertebral artery anomalies. So keep that in mind with your preoperative imaging. Uh, 41 patients had syrinxes, and then 16 patients also had a um, clipal file with C23 autofusion. And the mean operative time is an impressive 125 minutes. A mean blood loss, 128 minute uh, milliliters. So Dr. Gooley was talking about operative times in the 500 minute range. So significantly decreasing um, operative time by just going posterior and distracting. So they uh, measured the results with the, uh, the, jet, the myelopathy score improved in um, significantly between uh, preoperative and postoperative values. 
Uh, Chamberlain's line, which I've uh, marked here, also improved as expected. Wack, um, Wackenham line, which is basically an extension of McClivus, was improved. McRae's line also improved significantly. The anterior atlantodental interval improved. The posterior atlantodental interval also improved, which is basically the, the uh, width of the spinal canal at the foramen magnum. And finally, you can see that the um, clival uh, cervical angle broadened, which demonstrates a you know, reduction of that um, settling that, you, that we see preoperatively. Uh, there were a few complications, uh, not very many. Uh, one patient had increased spasticity, which improved at six months followed up. One patient had hemilingual atrophy, which partially recovered at six months of follow up. Uh, one patient had dysphagia after surgery, dysphagia, um, which recovered at six months follow up. And then two patients had unilateral vertebral artery occlusion. However, they did not have any symptoms. Um, so, this paper points out five main keys to the surgery. One is distraction of the deformed and lateral and vaginated facet joints. Now remember these patients are placed under a significant am amount of traction. So a lot of the work is kind of done for you preoperatively, but then using those dilators to kind of bilaterally go one side at a time to not create any uh, um, kind of unilateral deformity. Um, and then ensuring that you preserve the cortical surfaces of the articular surfaces so that when you place those graphs, there's no settling and re-emergence um, re of the basilar invagination because of subsidence. Um, avoiding vertebral artery injury, just being aware of the patient's anatomy and knowing that it's gonna, that you're likely gonna encounter an anom anomalous vertebral artery um, that even, for example, in this depiction demonstrates one near the C2 nerve root and uh, posteriorly. And then the, they used custom designed cages to fit these articular spaces and then performing that occipit to C2 fusion with that cantilever maneuver, I think is pretty critical. Um, kind of a narrow indication for this surgery based on this study, and there's no control group and, and no mention of other techniques results and how their results compared. And also we have to keep in mind that this was a single author experience. Great, thank you very much, um, Matthew. Um, a couple of quick points. Uh, obviously, this uh, was a uh, technique in a paper restricted to uh, cranialization and fusion of occiput to C1. Uh, so I want to ask the, the panelists, Dr. Bowman, do you want to comment on whether you would think that this applies to all cases of basilar invagination, regardless of congenital anomaly or not, uh, such as the inflammatory uh, group? Uh, and uh, whether uh, you would um, prefer uh, to put in a cage uh, to distract here, uh, or uh, as I know, Dr. Atul Gold, who's a proponent of this, talks about more reliance on fusion at the C12 joint uh, that's achieved once there's been distraction through traction, for example, and then fixation at the OC junction to preserve the gain that you have. Um, I, I I mean, the, the answer to the first question is this could potentially be used for every basilar invagination case, whether it's necessary, that's a different question. I think, you know, for these inflammatory sources of basilar invagination, I think just a C12 fusion plus or minus uh, a C1 laminectomy um, uh, or, um, you know, uh, foramen magnum decompression is all that is necessary. Um, I just have to point out though, that these, this particular technique description is just awesome. It is amazing. These, these surgeons are the leaders in the world at doing this particular type of surgery. Same thing with uh, the, the folks in, in India that, you know, uh, at Atul's um, uh, uh, institution as well at, as at Ames in New Delhi, those, those guys are like the world leaders at doing this type of surgery. And you're seeing that some of the pathology that they're dealing with there, it's not the small amount of panis that's pushing on the brainstem. They're dealing with, you know, complete cranialization of the odontoid process. That is a much more onerous operation to do with an indirect decompression. And I, I, I do have to say, I have tried to tackle these types of malformations with an indirect decompression with the, you know, vertical disimpaction. 
it requires some very specialized uh, uh, tools. And the good news is that we have access to um, versions of these tools. You don't have to have these customized cages like uh, they have in this paper. Uh, there are versions of this. In fact, you know, we uh, our uh, my group recently published a paper of you know, using cages in the transfer in the articular space between C one two, um, and there are you know, and you could always fashion allographs that can fit in there. What's more, what's the greater key to this though is um, having control over the angle of the odontoid process. And that is the most difficult part of this. Um, this particular paper doesn't show all of the, the, the nuances of the um, procedure. They have this cantilever method that they're showing, but there's other ways to do it. And I honestly think that actually the cantilever method is fairly ineffective with polyaxial screws at C2. What will happen is the rod will just tip over. Um, what you need is a strong fixation, maybe go down to C3 or 4 and then pull it down. But more importantly, you have to be really careful when you distract that you're not accidentally pushing the odontoid process um, dorsally right. towards the brainstem when you're doing that. And yeah. so it's really important that you're doing both a uh, compression, a posterior compression maneuver while you're doing an anterior distraction maneuver. And that is technically difficult. Um, yeah. And that's why these people are should be commended for being able to do. I, it's a mind boggling that they're doing sixty five of these in such a short period of time in one you know, year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it's yeah. So they are they, they need to be recognized as world leaders in this particular yeah. operation. Yeah. Uh, I do have to say though, you know, the stuff that I see in my clinic is far less uh, severe <laughs> compared yeah. to this. But I do see a fair number of congenital forms of this. And so the congenital ones, yeah, you, uh, the way I treat them is I do a, a less uh, significant vertical disimpaction. And then whatever's left over, I'll clean up through the front. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we, we have one paper left. Um, Dr. Porter, if I can ask you to uh, keep it as punchy and uh, succinct as possible, as you always do. Uh, as we, we have uh, limited time, I want to respect uh, the uh, audience's time. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank the Seattle Science Foundation for this uh, opportunity. So I'm Zach Porter. I'm one of the third year residents here. I'm going to be talking about a paper that was published in uh, Neurosurgical Focus this year, a uh, single institution uh, um, comparative analysis for a Don Twitter section. Uh, the newer uh, posterior transaxis approach, which I'll discuss, versus the um, uh, approach the group had previously used for the odontoidectomy, the anterior transnasal or uh, endoscopic approach. Um, so I think we we had discussed uh, basilar and vagination and how um, significant of a um, uh, medical comorbidities this, this can cause and the need for treatment in certain patients. And uh, typically the treatment is, of, of course, a, uh, if an odontoidectomy is going to be performed, treatment is classically a two-staged approach with uh, an O to C fusion being performed in the first stage and then an odontoidectomy at a, at a different stage. Uh, the authors here describe uh, a single stage approach with a single midline incision to accomplish both the uh, odyssey fusion and the odontoidectomy simultaneously. Uh, they published this approach, uh, this novel approach in, in 2022. They didn't detail all of the technical nuances, but um, what they described a, a patient being physician prone. This particular patient had an odyssey six fusion. So an incision was made from the external occipital protuberance to C7 after dissection of the uh, skin and soft tissues. Uh, the C1 posterior arch was removed. The uh, suboccipital craniectomy was performed. And, um, and essentially, the authors described the, the key point, uh, the key step as identifying and exposing the junction of the uh, C2 lamina and the C2 pedicles. This is really the access route to the odontoid that they describe. And of course, there's important structures in this area that ought to be um, uh, 
considered, including the C2 nerve root, which may need to be uh, retracted or resected, even um, the venous plexus, vertebral artery, for which they use the Doppler to identify, and the spinal cord itself, which has to be actually re um, uh, retracted with this particular approach. So then after the uh, this landmark is identified, the microscope is brought in, a surgical corridor is created with the drill, uh, interoperative neuronavigation is used to uh, confirm the trajectory as being appropriate to access the odontoid, and then the endoscope is, is brought in to complete the odontoidectomy. Uh, and then this is these are a few of their um, uh, patients that they, uh, using this approach, the top lines being the preoperative scans, and then in the bottom lines, you can see the um, complete resection of the odontoid, the suboccipital craniectomy, and the odyssey fusion, and the same for this patient. Uh, one question I had when I was, this was actually a novel technique to me, I hadn't heard of it. Um, uh, it just made me wonder um, the, regarding the feasibility of this approach, it just seemed like there would be extensive um, retraction on the spinal cord to be able to access the dens uh, from the C2 lamina. The authors actually admit that for a normal patient with normal anatomy of the odontoid, this approach wouldn't be feasible for that reason. However, they note that the uh, backward protruding and dislocated dens um, in patients with vascular invagination actually short, shortens the access distance and makes it feasible uh, to do this approach in patients with vascular invagination. Uh, so I wanted to look that up a little bit. There was a uh, paper published in World Neurosurgery in 2018 uh, a CT imaging study of patients with basilar invagination. And really quick, what they found was that compared to normal patients, patients with basilar invagination and, and especially basilar invagination with the lanoaxial dislocation, they actually had shortened dontoid processes and they had a decreased ratio of height to width of the dontoid. So in other words, compared to normal patients, these patients have a, have a shortened and a wider flattened uh, dens. Of course, normal patients, this route would be uh, inaccessible to get to the dens from this approach, but in patients with this um, anatomy, uh, it, it can be, be feasible. So uh, regarding the methods of this paper, it was a single institutional retrospective review based on the, uh, the surgical approach that the authors used. Uh, initially, you know, starting around 2009, they used the anterior and the nasal approach for the odontoidectomy. And then more recently, they, they used the transaxis, transaxis approach, and they looked at outcomes in different factors. Uh, so comparing the approaches, um, basically, there was 13 total patients, seven that had the anterior and the nasal, and six with the um, transaxis approach. Um, the biggest thing is that functional outcome uh, at two months, most patients um, had, had good functional outcome. There was one patient that, in the uh, anterior endonasal approach that had um, a couple of intraoperative complications, including um, injury to the basilar artery that led to a decrease in functional outcome. But otherwise, all patients in both groups had release, relief of symptoms and uh, significant symptom improvement. The biggest difference was, of course, the operative time. So in the anterior and the nasal two-stage surgery, the operative time was on average seven hours, ranged six to nine hours, six to about 10 hours, whereas in the single-stage approach, the average operative time was three and a half hours with a range of three to four hours. The length of hospitalization was also uh, less in these patients. For the two-stage approach, the length of stay was about 25 days. And in their uh, single stage approach, the length of stay was 7.3 days, the range of four to 10 days. They highlighted several considerations of their, the approach that they described. Uh, first, compared to other or compared to posterior lateral approaches, um, uh, in this approach, the vertebral artery is not uh, manipulated or doesn't require manipulation. And also compared to the lateral approaches, you can actually have bilateral access to the odontoid. And then compared to um, you know, any two-stage approach, they're gonna have decreased risks associated with dislocation between C1 and C2, between surgeries, uh, reduces complications related to prolonged operative time. And as was previously discussed, injury to the oropharynx, basilar artery, or infection that can be um, caused by the um, endoscopic and the nasal approaches. Limitations of the surgery they discuss may require, um, you may need to sacrifice a C2 nerve root 
And they do uh, note that it does require an endoscopic access uh, to be able to do this approach. So their conclusions, um, basically their preliminary data support success and utility of this approach for odontoid resection. Uh, it's, a, it's a novel approach that uh, offers all therapeutic demands in single stage surgery. And they actually consider it as a primary available approach for patients with basilar invagination. Excellent, thank you, perfect timing. So uh, we, we really included this paper as a novel way of thinking of uh, perhaps approaching uh, this pathology from the back. However, as you just heard, it really is applicable uh, to uh, even the majority of these cases. Uh, but it's interesting to note that in the retroverted, uh, significantly angled odontoid, uh, the pathway to approach is shorter and that's what makes it interesting and possible. I, I have reservations about this approach um, with, for more than that. Um, all right, well, I'd like to thank uh, everybody, uh, uh, the, the residents and the panelists for joining us. It was a pleasure uh, to be involved and uh, we look forward to uh, being on again in the future. Scott, do you want to take us out of here? Uh, well, I hope everybody uh, enjoys uh, the uh, holiday weekend. It was a great session. Uh, I learned a lot of something I don't do anymore. So um, thank you for University of Arkansas Neurosurgery Department. And uh, we'll see you all. Uh, we've got arthroplasty coming up uh, this month, too. So next Tuesday night, I believe. Yeah, we have That's I right. think, star uh, Rick and Scott. Thank you. We have an all star panel. I think it's going to be a historic session. Right, Rick? Can you tell us quickly about that? Absolutely. Yes, we're going to have uh, Dr. Terry Marnay on, and we're also going to have uh, one of the other developers of the Act of L, uh, Rolando Garcia, and I think even Karen Butner Johns, although I'm not certain. So they're the developers of the three, the developers of the three modern arthroplasties that we use today. The Charité we no longer use, but of course we use the active on the pro disc and we'll have their developers on. So it should be a wonderful discussion and it'll be a lively round table. It's, it's, but also I want to compliment the folks from Arkansas. You did a wonderful job as usual. Thank you. Thank you. It was a Very pleasure. Nice Thank you all. Happy holidays. All right. Take care. See you next Bye. Tuesday. Bye-bye. Ciao.